The Rose Beetle Man, Chapter 3 of My Family and Other Animals, by Gerald Durrell. In the morning, when I woke, the bedroom shutters were luminous and barred with gold from the rising sun. The morning air was full of the scent of charcoal from the kitchen fire, full of eager cock crows, the distant yap of dogs, and the unsteady, melancholy tune of the goat bells as the flocks were driven out to pasture. We ate breakfast out in the garden, under the small tangerine trees. The sky was fresh and shining, not yet the fierce blue of noon, but a clear, milky opal. The flowers were half asleep, roses dew crumpled, marigolds still tightly shut. Breakfast was, on the whole, a leisurely and silent meal, for no member of the family was very talkative at that hour. By the end of the meal, the influence of the coffee, toast, and eggs made itself felt, and we started to revive. To tell each other what we intended to do, why we intended to do it, and then argue earnestly as to whether each had made a wise decision. I never joined in these discussions, for I knew perfectly well what I intended to do, and would concentrate on finishing my food as rapidly as possible. Must you gulp and slush your food like that? Larry would inquire in a pained voice, delicately picking his teeth with a matchstick. Eat it slowly, dear, mother would murmur. There's no hurry. No hurry? With Roger waiting at the garden gate, an alert black shape watching for me with eager brown eyes? No hurry? With the first sleepy cicadas starting to fiddle experimentally among the olives? No hurry? With the island waiting, morning cool, bright as a star to be explored? I could hardly expect the family to understand this point of view, however. So, I would slow down until I felt their attention had been attracted elsewhere, and then stuff my mouth again. Finishing at last, I would slip from the table and saunter towards the gate, where Roger sat gazing at me with a questioning air. Together, we would peer through the wrought iron gates into the olive groves beyond. I would suggest to Roger that perhaps it wasn't worth going out today. He would wag his stump in hasty denial, and his nose would butt at my hand. No, I would say, I really didn't think we ought to go out. It looked as though it was going to rain, and I would peer up into the clear, burnished sky with a worried expression. Roger, ears cocked, would peer into the sky too, and then look at me imploringly. Anyway, I would go on. If it didn't look like rain now, it was almost certain to rain later, and so it would be much safer just to sit in the garden with the book. Roger, in desperation, would place a large black paw on the gate and then look at me, lifting one side of his upper lip, displaying his white teeth in a lopsided, ingratiating grin, his stump working itself into a blur of excitement. This was his trump card, for he knew I could never resist his ridiculous grin. So I would stop teasing him, fetch my matchboxes and my butterfly net. The garden gate would creak open and clang shut, and Roger would be off through the olive groves, swiftly as a cloud shadow, his deep bark welcoming the new day. In those early days of exploration, Roger was my constant companion. Together, we ventured farther and farther afield, discovering quiet, remote olive groves which had to be investigated and remembered, working our way through a maze of blackbird-haunted myrtles, venturing into narrow valleys where the cypress trees cast a cloak of mysterious inky shadows. He was the perfect companion for an adventure, affectionate without exuberance, brave without being belligerent, intelligent, and full of good-humored tolerance for my eccentricities. If I slipped when climbing a dew-shiny bank, Roger appeared suddenly, gave a snort that sounded like suppressed laughter, a quick look over, a rapid lick of commiseration, shook himself, sneezed, and gave me his lopsided grin. If I found something that interested me, an ant's nest, a caterpillar on a leaf, a spider wrapping up a fly in swaddling clothes of silk, Roger sat down and waited until I had finished examining it. If he thought I was taking too long, he shifted nearer, gave a gentle, whiny yawn, and then sighed deeply and started to wag his tail. If the matter was of no great importance, we would move on. But, 
If it was something absorbing that had to be poured over, I had only to frown at Roger, and he would realize it was going to be a long job. His ears would droop, his tail slow down and stop, and he would slouch off to the nearest bush and fling himself down into the shade, giving me a martyred look as he did so. Okay, so that was part one of The Rose Beetle Man. Um, I really wish I had the ability, not the ability, the know-how on how to edit video. Um, I've probably sat here for the past hour and a half trying to read you five-minute excerpt from a book, and I'm just not great at it. Um, I'm going to continue doing it. Tomorrow there will be part two. I'm assuming that there will probably be three parts in total of this. So if you're interested in hearing the rest of this chapter, please come back tomorrow. And if you're not, that's okay too. Um, eventually I'll go back to doing something else unless this has a big reaction and people enjoy it. Um, but thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Remember, throughout your life, advance daily. Becoming more skillful than yesterday, more skillful than today. This is never ending.